Order members, the next item in the order paper is a motion in the name of Mr. Barney McDuff and others. The business committee is agreed to up to one hour, 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose the motion and 10 minutes to wind. And all other speakers will have five minutes. And I would ask the clerk to please read the motion. That this assembly acknowledges the scandal that occurred in the Bon Secours Sisters Institution in Tuam, County Galway, where almost 800 children died whilst in the care of a religious order and were placed in a mass unmarked grave over a period of five decades. Notes the intention of the Dublin government to take steps to establish the best course of action to investigate the deaths of these children and the appalling manner of their interment. Recognises that the abusive practices which occurred at the Bon Secours Sisters Mother and Baby Care Home were not unique and were replicated in similar institutions across the island of Ireland and calls for all government departments and their agencies, as well as religious orders, to proactively cooperate with any investigation that takes place to establish the truth behind this scandal. Barry Michael Duff uh, to move the motion. Mr okay. Michael Duff. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, at the outset uh, of this debate, I want to say that uh, the reason I have such a strong interest is probably because uh, I've been in regular contact with a number of constituents, a number of women, uh, a number of girls, a number of ladies in my own constituency of West Tyrone and other constituencies in the north as well who have, uh, who have had terrible experiences in mother and baby homes, including in Belfast and in Newry. And, uh, I dedicate my remarks today to the women uh, whom I'm in contact with on a regular basis, uh, basically providing a listening ear to them and trying to offer as much support as I can to them, as well as calling for uh, appropriate action to be taken to support them in their quest for the truth. Now, uh, one of the women with whom I'm in regular contact, uh, she was at the age of 17. Uh, admitted to the Marionville home in Newry, and uh, she subsequently gave birth uh, to a son, and it took a long time before uh, she was reconnected to her son because her baby boy was taken from her at the birth and uh, was adopted without her consent. And the lady in question uh, is basically crying to the world what is going to be done about this. It's a very harrowing story. And uh, she had her son taken away, and then she was reunited with him. And uh, this, the harrowing story includes uh, references to being made to scrub floors while heavily pregnant. Another lady with whom I'm in uh, regular contact is uh, the baby that was given away an adoptee, and this lady spent decades trying to trace her birth mother. And I do have in my possession a consent to adoption form, which was allegedly signed by uh, the baby's mother. And it's very, very contested that uh, it is believed that this was not signed at all by the baby's mother, and that the mother's signature was forged on this consent to adop adoption form. The mother, uh, in this case of the adoptee, uh, also gave birth to two other children, and the siblings were kept apart, and the mother was forced to keep her secret for 50 years, and she lost her three children to adoption uh, in the 1960s. Now, these are women that I know uh, they are constituents of mine, and I am in regular contact with them. And sometimes, uh, as someone who is not an expert on the subject, you can get overwhelmed by uh, the story, the harrowing nature of the story that one is told. But this isn't just the film, uh, Philomena. This is real life, and it has happened in the recent past. It has happened in the recent past. The first lady whom I referred to, uh, her admission date to Marion Vale in Newry, 
was January 1980. January 1980, where a young woman from my constituency gave birth to a baby boy, and that baby boy was taken from her, and again, again, her signature was forged on, uh, on the consent uh, to adopt form, just like the other case that I specifically mentioned. Now, I did attend the Doyle debate on Wednesday, the 11th of June, and I did so because I was challenged by one of the women in question to sit beside her during this hearing. And it was a very powerful evening. Uh, there was a vigil outside, which was attended by many, many people, including uh, my close colleague, Michelle Gilder, new MP. Both Michelle and I travelled to Dublin on that evening to be of as much support as we could to the mothers in question and to the adoptees in question as well. Now, the scandal of Tuam is, has been described as perhaps too graphic and too horrendous to believe children and babies denied a proper, decent and humane burial, a reminder of a darker past. It is known that 796 children were buried between 1925 and 1961 there, and this was uh, discovered by the research of historian Catherine Corliss. Thankfully, uh, the Irish government has moved in the recent past to establish, to establish a commission of investigation into all of this. And the commission of investigation will obviously need to address the shocking infant mortality rates in uh, the mother and baby homes, a diet of malnutrition, neglect, starvation, TB and other diseases, uh, mothers were forced to live secretive lives and sad lives, disowned by their families, shunned by their community, and all of that, screened from people uh, should they go to Mass or go to a place of worship, uh, because this is cross-denominational as well. The story of the Bethany homes uh, in, in Dublin makes that clear. So it needs to look at all of these things, and uh, it needs to be wide in scope, because essentially we're looking at the imprisonment of pregnant women, taking babies from mothers against their will, resulting in a reservoir of great hurt, burying children and babies without individual markers or identification, mothers not knowing where their children's final resting place is, the whole business of illegal adoption and trafficking to the USA and other countries of an unknown number of children, and, and most perhaps shocking of all, the subjecting of children to vaccine trials and uh, where the child died uh, on occasions the child's body was dissected for medical research and uh, I have lots of anecdotal evidence from the, the women that I know about how harrowing it was in those homes. So I would say about the commission of investigation uh, that uh, Minister Flanagan and others are going to preside over that it cannot be limited, it mustn't be too narrow, and it should include any institution which incarcerated mainly unmarried mothers and their children. And I would emphasise that in the south of Ireland, it was not a uniquely Catholic phenomenon. It applied to uh, state homes, state regulated homes, and some Protestant homes as well. And in the north, uh, it happened in the north as well, as everybody knows, and more and more light is being thrown upon it. And the reason I know a wee bit about it is because of the regular contact I'm in with both mothers and adoptees from West Tyrone in this matter. Yes. Um, I, I totally thank the member for giving way, giving way and I, I agree with everything that he has said. But uh, it, struck to me, it struck me that there was there's a strong parallel here between uh, the issue outlined by the member and that of the disappeared. For example, I'm thinking of the late Mrs. McVeigh, whose son Columba was taken away, murdered and buried, his remains never to be returned. And would the member think that it would be helpful to have a commission of inquiry into the issue of the disappeared as well? I to members that this is a specific motion to a specific subject, so I wouldn't want members to turn into another issue that is totally a separate issue, and that's even for members who uh, will take interventions. So I think we do need to be careful. 
And just to say, in relation to that matter specifically, um, that I don't think it's the business of today, but it is relevant. And uh, certainly, my party leader, uh, Gerry Adams, has pledged uh, all cooperation uh, on the part of Irish Republicans in that matter. And certainly, if anybody does have any information, they, sh they should come forward. Uh, but I would like as much bipartisanship here today, I would like as much consensus as possible in the spirit of this motion, because uh, it happened in the north, it happened in the south, it happened all over Ireland. And in the north, it wasn't just a uniquely Catholic phenomenon either. Um, a list of homes that I have in my possession now, uh, for example, the Mayflower Hostel, Belfast, uh, where the voluntary organization was the Salvation Army, uh, Marion Vale in Newry. And uh, from, the late, uh, from the period of the 1970s, it's clear that the, the state was paying for mothers and babies to be maintained in many of these homes. Pre-1948, they might have been known as workhouses, but this is a matter for state homes, for Catholic religious order homes, for Protestant religious order homes. Bring your remarks to a close. Do you have an additional minute? No. No, okay. I thank members for listening. They know essentially what I'm saying. Uh, let's do everything in our power to establish truth and justice for the mothers and babies and let any investigation, north or south, not be too narrow, but to uncover all types of institutions. John Dallet. Mr. Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask myself the question, what can this debate achieve and how can the outcomes influence what we do and how people are treated in the future? What contribution can I make which will break down prejudices, eliminate social inequality, stop moral judgments, and achieve a level of health care and protection which ends for all time the inequalities which still exist and affect children here in Ireland and across the world, especially in the developing countries of Africa and South America. The Bond Secure Sisters Institution, I suggest, did not set out to attract the kind of notoriety which is now presented in the media. Indeed, Catherine Corliss, the local historian who did the research, has made it clear she never claimed that 800 bodies uh, in a septic tank. But her research does indicate that 796 children died from disease over a 36-year period, from tuberculosis, convulsions, measles, whooping cough, influenza, bronchitis and meningitis. The reality, however, is that it happened, and the world was either helpless or stood by, and no one talked, wanted to talk, or were afraid to talk. Today, the prejudices have gone away, or have they? Do those prejudices and inequalities still exist, but are applied to different groups, to the elderly in some nursing homes, or perhaps to the travelling community, or indeed to children abused in human trafficking? Is the world still looking on? still afraid to speak out and still not wanting to rock the boat, or indeed, are there still deep-seated prejudices against those who have no voice and no influence? But the question, Mr Speaker, is what can we learn from the past, from the Bond Secure Sisters Institution in Chewham, or indeed other institutions much closer to home? Have we fully understood or want to speak out about other injustices in the past? And I just mentioned very briefly. Uh, the Great Famine, for example, which happened 70 years earlier. I don't think we have. And dare I say it, we still have to find a way to commemorate and pay our respects to the millions of children over the years who died on this island down through history. Was the Great Famine not to them earlier? When those who could have prevented it stood idly by, while stepping up the export of food to record levels, while ignoring the diseased and destitute dying in the ditchbacks, while they wrote letters to London about their impending peerages. Of course it was, but it was worse, much worse. And you'd be relieved to know I'm returning to the motion. It calls on all government departments and agencies, as well as religious orders, to proactively cooperate with any investigation that takes place to establish the truth behind the Tune scandal. But I believe, Mr Speaker, we must go much further than that and set aside time to discuss and decide how we commemorate those children, whether they were the victims of the Bond Secure Sisters Institution in Chum or those other institutions I mentioned earlier. 
Commemorations have been very much in our mind in recent years, focused on political and religious events. But in doing so, we have overlooked the sacrifices and the tragedies that have impacted on thousands and indeed millions of people. The Tuam institution is but one, the one we are debating today. In conclusion, I and my party would want to see two things emerge from this debate. Yes, I want to see an investigation, an inquiry, call it what you may, but not just for the sake of it. There were, these were children, angels, who didn't even merit the description legitimate on their official birth and baptism records. This nation has much to address from our past history, including, dare I say it, the recent and tragic deaths of those children who lost their lives in what we euphemistically call the Troubles. May God forgive those who were involved, and may, may we all remember them and make amends for those who failed them or, we, or were in any way associated with their deaths. Mr Speaker, let this debate be the emergence of a new horizon in which we can look back with contrition on what happened to our children in Tuam and elsewhere. Above all, let us remember them and let us commemorate them because, as was pointed out, those were our ancestors from the past uh, from uh, across the community. It wasn't exclusively one community or another. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Um, delighted to, to say a few words in support of the motion uh, and thank the members who brought the motion uh, to the House. Uh, but with, of course, uh, acknowledging that simply in debating the matter, uh, we raise expectations. Uh, expectations not for a few people, uh, but for numbers measured in six figures, uh, for as far as I can understand it, well over 100,000 people uh, are affected by the issue uh, we debate today. And they have expectations uh, which have heretofore often been dashed. Uh, whether I've been dealing with victims uh, as a journalist with BBC Radio, Ulster Television, the Victims Commission, or as a politician, too often I meet a victim who feels doubly victimised. Firstly, by the incident, uh, but secondly, and to some extent more shockingly, by what happened after that. Because there was an expectation when something went wrong that the state and the agencies of the state would form the wagons into a circle around them, that whatever they needed, they would get, uh, whether it was in terms of health, social services, education, finances. And the exact opposite often happens, and it is the case with the people uh, we discuss in this debate uh, this afternoon, Mr. Speaker. And they also feel uh, that while there have been a number of inquiries on both sides of the border uh, into these issues, they have been limited and imperfect, including the current historical institutional abuse inquiry, uh, which scope uh, denies access to people who were abused uh, clerically, but not in institutions. Will I will give way. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for giving way. And in light of what he has just said, I'm wondering what confidence there is uh, that any further investigations uh, will actually get to the root of the problem and actually find uh, where the real problem was and try to bring some comfort uh, to those who are still alive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for that uh, very salient point. It is a question, I believe, of will and not just political will. There are other very powerful institutions uh, who have to open up their books and be transparent uh, about what happened. And the point by Mr. Elliott is well made. And there is a suspicion uh, amongst the victims uh, that inquiries are limited and are extended uh, in the hope that time will drag on and people, quite simply, will die and the issue will therefore go away. Well, it will not go away. Danny Kennedy and I had the pleasure of meeting some survivors and others uh, this morning, including from Bethany Holmes. I want briefly, Mr. Speaker, just to quote some experiences from one survivor uh, of a home who had the courage uh, to tell his story. His name's John Hill. He says, I was born in the Church of Ireland Magdalen home in Leeson Street, Dublin, uh, in 1946. I was fostered out as free labour to farmers from a very young age. 
I was found to be badly malnourished with rickets. I couldn't walk. I was sent to a family in Carlow until I was 10, required to do manual labour from about the age of five or six. I worked before I walked five miles to school each morning. We milked cows, collected sheep, fed poultry, generally worked as free child labour on the farm. We were slave labour, I suppose. At the same time, the family received money for us from public funds. We were isolated from other members of the family. At house parties, we were sent off to bed, and when the gentry called, we were fed separately. I was a slave all my young life. The Irish state and the Church of Ireland were my parents. They let me down badly. I think they should admit to their sins. I want my files that are now held by PACT, formerly the Protestant Adoption Society, and the Rotunda, taken over by the government. I want to know why my files were transferred to the Nurses Rescue Society and then to PACT. I want answers. I can handle the truth. Well, if he can handle the truth, Mr Speaker, we owe it to him to give him access to the truth. And that means admissions books for homes, adoption and transfer files, death certificates and burial records for private cemeteries, the minute books of the homes, uh, the records of anatomy schools, in including the School of Medicine at Queen's, and details of the obligations on these homes to notify the deaths and to whom they were to be notified. Uh, Mr Speaker, if unionism has questions to answer, it's time for unionism to step up to the plate. And if the Ulster Unionist Party has questions to answer, we are at the plate. Tell us what we have to do to put this to rights. We stand ready to do what is right. We are not a religious organisation. We are a political party, and it is our determination today to do what we can to ensure that people like John Hill, who has had the courage to put into the public domain his personal experience, that he gets access to the truth. He says he can handle it. The question is not whether victims and survivors can handle it. It is whether organisations, including the political parties and these political institutions, can handle giving access to the truth and admitting when we got it so horribly and horrendously wrong. Trevor Lund. Mr. Lund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I uh, apologise to Mr. Michael Duff and to yourself for not being here for the start of the debate. Unfortunately, the change of timings really caught me out today. But I, I rise to support the motion. Indeed, I don't know how anybody could do otherwise, frankly. Uh, bon, bon secours. I, I looked up the meaning of that. It means good, good help, assistance, succour. I imagine the secours means succour. Uh, come to us if you need help, you know. Now, that's the image of a caring institution, a place run by a female religious order in tandem with the state where mothers and babies would be treated with respect and compassion. The truth is clearly different. It's a place where mothers and babies were incarcerated and treated as social outcasts, as criminals or sinners. A place where the mortality rate amongst the children was far beyond the expected average, or when compared to the mortality rate amongst children born within marriage, there's a, a tremendous difference. These deaths were, were blamed on disease, on measles, on uh, meningitis, influenza, and, and malnutrition. Well, you know, who, whose fault was the malnutrition? Now, this place was run by the sisters and the poor law authorities. Could it not even feed the children? To, to compound this, as the children died, mostly before they reached their first birthday, they were put into a mass grave, and in the words of Minister Flanagan and the Doyle the other day, discarded over several decades, and I think he chose the right word. There doesn't appear to have been a Christian burial. And if it is true that this grave was indeed a disused septic tank, and I don't know if that's true or not, well, then the horror is complete. It just beggars belief that any kind of a society of nuns or religious institution could behave like that towards innocent children. Whatever view society may have taken of their, of the, in those days of their, their mothers, that this approach appears to have been common across Ireland. I read in the Irish Times just at the weekend about Pellettstown, about Bespra, the Sean Ross Abbey and Tipperary and Castle Pollard, all run by religious orders and all with, with similar experiences. The, the attitude of the state authorities and those who ran the institution was deplorable. 
But it, it's obvious that the population generally either chose or was influenced to turn a blind eye to what happened and the, the, to these what they would call fallen women, and particularly their offspring. Mr. Speaker, every country has its dark secrets. Ireland, North and South, is not unique. And, but reading the words of Minister Flanagan and the Taoiseach in the recent Doyle discussion, there is a recognition that the, the truth must be established. And likewise, in the North, the Anthony Hart's inquiry is underway. And I, I hope that if there are limitations on that inquiry, that they will be removed in the interest of bringing all the truth forward. Because that's the only way to go with something like this. I hope that all necessary resources and time will be given to bring out the truth of what happened here. And we're, we're not immune from all this. Mr. Speaker, this is a, a sound motion. I hope the whole House will support it. Some, some of these homes didn't close until the 1980s. We're not dealing necessarily with ancient history here. And we need to establish the truth for the, for the living and, and for the dead. I, I hope the House will support the motion. I congratulate Mr. Michael Duff for bringing it. And thank you very much. Uh, Danny Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Speaker, grateful for the opportunity to uh, contribute to this important debate. I thank the sponsors for, for bringing it forward. Uh, and I uh, want to clearly indicate uh, my support for uh, this motion. I think, Mr. Speaker, it is very fair to say that uh, the treatment of, of mothers and children in homes and institutions throughout Ireland, both north and south, has been nothing short of disgraceful. Um, and it's almost medieval in its cruelty. Uh, and I think that the stories of children and families affected have gone to the very core and touched uh, the nerve of the, the entire society. And the human feelings and the reactions and the emotions aroused uh, have clearly uh, impacted on people the length and breadth uh, of uh, this island. And the recent story emerging from Tume um, has um, served at least to further highlight uh, what was done, um, either in the name of the state or in the name of religion, which is potentially even more distressing. Uh, I have um, attempted to give support to the, the families of the, the Bethany home uh, victims and the survivors of it, uh, and I had the, the privilege to attend uh, the memorial service and the unveiling uh, of a new memorial at Mount Jerome Cemetery in Dublin uh, in early April. Uh, and I, in turn, have sought to, issue, uh, to raise issues on behalf of the Bethany uh, group with both uh, Taoiseach Enda Kenny and Alan Shatter, uh, latterly uh, Minister of Justice in the Republic. I think following uh, the Tume exposure, uh, the Government of the Republic of Ireland has indicated its intention to establish an independent commission of inquiry. Uh, I welcome that. Uh, and see it as uh, progress. Uh, I hope very much that it will take uh, the opportunity to investigate fully all of the issues. There are positive indications that homes such as the Bethany Home and others will be included in this inquiry, uh, and I hope very much that that will be the case, because I do believe uh, that we as an administration, uh, the Northern Ireland Executive, and indeed this Assembly has a responsibility to fully cooperate uh, with any investigations launched. And I go further to say that church records from all churches and all denominations should be made fully available uh, for any such inquiry. But I say, Mr Speaker, I come from an evangelical Protestant background. It is inescapable to me that there were very clear failures on the part of mainstream and smaller denominations within the Protestant community in respect of these issues. I believe it is the Christian duty of all those churches and denominations who hold records, who have uh, accounts, and who can make and give insight and important light uh, in any matter of inquiry that they should do so, however difficult and however um, challenging it will be.
But I do believe that at a government level, at an institutional level and at a church level, we must ensure that this issue is fully and comprehensively dealt with. There is the whiff, Mr. Speaker, of cover-up. It is the mark of any decent society. It is the mark of any civilised society that, that, uh, that we make sure that no such cover-up is allowed or continued. And we must deal with this if we want to truly call ourselves a civilised society. I support the motion. And I too apologise for, for being late into the chamber. I, I also got caught out by the time, and so apologies for that. I, I rise obviously to support the motion. And uh, th this is a real tragedy for those who have lived in and in some cases died in mother and baby homes. There is no doubt that coverage in the past few weeks will have evoked very painful memories for people. I know, like a lot of members in this House and the wider public, I was totally appalled by the reports emerging from Chewham. There is no justification for what happened. No one cannot abdicate the responsibilities. The institutions and agencies of the state need to face up to this shameful period. This discovery in Chewham, Galway, provides a horrific account of absolute neglect and maltreatment by those in charge. These institutions were effectively places of imprisonment for pregnant women. Unfortunately, this was not an isolated case, and our hearts have been very much moved by this situation. And it's a very difficult subject for man many of us to comprehend, never mind stomach. It is clear that the women and babies had no rights, and it's useful even to look at what the United Nations Conventions on the Right of Child states, in particular, it states children sh shall not be discriminated against and shall have equal access to protection. All decisions taken which affect children's lives should be taken in the child's best interests, and children have the right to have their voices heard in all matters concerning them. <clears throat> It is important for the government to search for a means to help those who have suffered so much for so long. And I welcome the fact that the government has agreed to set up a commission of investigation into all mother and baby homes. And this is a hugely sensitive and difficult issue. And it is vital that any inquiry or investigation must provide confidence to those communities, particularly for the victims and their families. I commend the researcher Catherine Corliss, who spent weeks going through records in libraries, churches and council offices, and she had uncovered the fact that between 1925 and 1961, almost 800 children had died in the St Mary's mother and baby homes run by nuns from those particular orders. But she was unable to find records of where they were buried until last September, when she suggests that many of the bodies may have been put in a disused septic tank in a corner of the home's garden, a spot where boys had discovered a pile of children's skeletons in the 1970s. When speaking about this office situation in Chewham, I'm also mindful of her own inquiry into historical institutional abuse. During consultations with victims and survivors, they had told our, our junior ministers that they wanted an opportunity to recount their experiences of the institutions and for those to be heard, believed and acknowledged. And obviously the inquiry included a confidential acknowledgement forum which addresses this issue, which obviously gives an opportunity for victims and survivors to talk about their childhoods in the institutions and how they were treated and what they endured. Victims and survivors have never talked about their experiences. For some, the opportunity to talk, be heard and acknowledge is so vitally important. Our inquiry is intended to investigate systemic failings regarding the provision of care in institutions, and it is important to emphasise that all children are vulnerable. And our legislation is rightly focused on those who were institutions. These children did not, have ac did not have access to others to speak on their behalf outside of the institutions they were in. So there is a need for the state to address their needs. In conclusion, again, this is a real tragedy, and I welcome the government inquiry. And I would urge all departments, agencies, and religious orders to cooperate with any investigation that takes place. Gora <coughs> Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I too apologise for missing the beginning of the debate? Um, the time has caught me out uh, as well. Um, this is a very difficult debate to take uh, part in. Um, it's a period of our history that I think um, has been 
hidden away, kept secret, uh, and largely ignored um, for far too long. And I want to commend the, uh, Mr. McElduff and the proposers uh, for, bringing it, uh, for bringing the subject to the House today, because um, one of the, the, the real shames in all of this um, is the fact that people didn't feel that they could confront some of the difficult issues uh, that we face, uh, that people face every day in uh, modern society. Uh, they couldn't talk about it. Uh, people had to hide away, uh, get sent away, uh, and taken away. And I think that is as much a shame for all of us uh, as anything else. Uh, there are very few communities, in fact, I'd say there are probably none uh, in the north, never mind across the island, uh, that haven't been touched in one way or another uh, by these kinds of issues. Um, but nobody talked about it. Uh, nobody felt they could talk about it. Um, there was a shame brought upon you if um, you were unmarried and uh, ended up in, uh, pregnant. Uh, Largely, that shame was on young women. There wasn't very much discussion about uh, young men who may have uh, played their part in it as well. I think it's, that's the biggest shame, is that people couldn't feel that they could talk about it. People couldn't feel that they could deal with it. And families um, did horrendous things, really, uh, to their own, um, things that I'm sure many people uh, regret uh, today. And unfortunately, the state, uh, both in the north and in the south, um, played their part uh, in all of that as well. Um, many people look to the Irish Proclamation 1916 as for, for inspiration. And it's, it's on every, uh, in most government buildings in Dublin. Uh, that talks about cherishing all the children of our nation equally. Uh, I think we failed uh, massively uh, to, uh, in terms of that standard. Uh, and I think a lot of the revelations that have come out in the last number of years around how uh, communities, uh, institutions, uh, and organizations of the state or otherwise treated young people, treated children, uh, is, is one that I just think we have, uh, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of making up to do. Uh, unfortunately, today, Mr. Speaker, we still have a lot of children in this, uh, in this city who are living in child poverty. Uh, we still have people leaving school with uh, very low educational attainment. Uh, so I think our job is to ensure that we have the proper investigations into all of these, uh, and I welcome the, the Irish government's approach to this the proper investigations into all the things that happened to get the truth out in the open and find some level of justice for those people who were put through some of these things. But our job is also to ensure that we leave a different legacy um, for uh, people coming forward. We need to ensure that we treat all of the children uh, of the nation, or whatever you want to call it, uh, equally, that people get the, all their opportunities. People don't have to live uh, in poverty and do get the opportunity to uh, reach their full potential. Uh, I would also like to commend the OFM, the FM, for bringing forward the, 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 the Justice Hart's inquiry that we have ongoing at the moment. But to reiterate our call and other people's call to ensure that that's not the end of it, and to ask again that we don't have to wait until this inquiry, which will take another year now than, than was a originally envisaged. This, we don't have to wait until that inquiry does its work and completes its work to actually look at all the other issues around Magdalene, laund Magdalene laundries, uh, clerical abuse and other things. Um, because for far too long, Mr. Speaker, uh, these things haven't been talked about. They've been kept under the carpet. And it Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Jennifer McCann, included on the motion, the member is 10 minutes. Okay, um, Mr. Speaker, can I just start off by, by thanking my colleagues for bringing this um, a motion, this very important motion, to the Assembly today. And I would hope, like as some of the other members have already stated, that we would have cross-party support for it. 
Um, I think that some members have already pointed out um, during the course of the debate there is probably nothing more that measures a society in the way that it treats its most vulnerable people. And who could in fact be more vulnerable than babies and young children or mothers who were forced to give up their babies? Our mothers who were forced or actually imprisoned in places um, like mother and baby homes and in other institutions and treated as outcasts from the rest of society, in fact treated as if they didn't, they, they, they didn't mean anything to anybody. And the scandal and the shameful way that those women were treated, you know, I just think that, that um, must have uh, an effect on anyone who is tuned in to listening to what we're hearing on the news and really the whole, the whole of the island of Ireland at the minute is engulfed around the shameful way that, that those people were treated. And they were treated, um, you know, for over five decades this treatment w was meted out by, as people have said, religious orders of all denominations, the state, but also wider society as well, because a lot of people must have known what was going on and simply didn't do anything about it. And I think that there is an onus on all of us who are part of that society today, whether we're in government or whether we're part of the religious orders or churches or part of that wider society, to expose the level of horror and to try in some way to make redress to those who were victims and survivors of that. Mr Speaker, we've witnessed um, over a, a period of time almost a drip feed of information coming to light through reports such as the Ryan report and the recent exposure of the Chewham scandal. And here in the North, we, are, we, we hear some reports about the historical institutional abuse inquiry. And I think that while this information is coming out and it is putting some parts of the jigsaw together for people, it is in no way getting to the scale of the problem and the questions that need to be answered. And there are questions such as why so many young infants and children died in those places, why there were so many and how many forcibly, uh, uh, people that were forcibly separated from their mothers and adopted. They were trafficked or they were sold. And many of these young children were sold to go off to work as cheap labour in other countries as well. And we still don't have an overall picture of just how many um, children were, were, were actually affected by this, or indeed how many mothers were affected either. So I think, you know, and, and, and sometimes, you know, um, when we need, to, we, need to talk, we need to talk about this because, as some of the members have said, sometimes it's brushed onto the, the, the carpet. Some of these children were actually used for medical purposes as well in, in experiments. So all that needs to be, um, all the information needs to be gathered, and we need to be looking over those five decades, right across the island of Ireland, both north and south, to get that information. We also need answers as to how many of these children were sexually abused, and also, you know, that when these shameful and horrific practices were going on, we need to know what the level of the state involvement and the state knowledge was in all of these institutions right across the island of Ireland. So that's the type of information that we need to get. And I know, I mean, I've spoke to, to some of the survivors uh, over, over a period of years, and, and as recently as last week, um, some of the victims and survivors. And, you know, what, what they're saying is they don't have a clear picture of that. They don't have access to records. So we need to be doing all in our power to ensure that uh, state records, but also the records that are held by religious orders or churches um, are also given over to those people to, for, for them to try and, and, and get some sort of sense of what happened, um, you know, what happened w w to, to them when they left the homes, but what happened to their mothers and everything else. So I think it's very, very important that all that information is given. And really, you know, I think it's imperative that we do have that thorough examination and I know some of the members already mentioned, it's not just mother and baby homes, it's also workhouses and, as I said, other institutions. Because really, you know, I think that, that, that we need to have the information at hand, first of all, do we see, to see the level of it. And I know we already have a, a sense of the, the dehumanising practices that, were, that mothers were forced to endure, to endure in institutions as the Magdalene Laundries. And again, uh, members have mentioned that already. 
And I know uh, um, that, that some members have indicated about you know, the h historical inst institutional abuse inquiry that's ongoing, and that some of the people in that uh, the, that were over 18 who were, were forced to um, have their babies in those laundries, that some of those aren't covered by that, that inquiry. And I, I can say um, you know, that, that hopefully you know, I'm, speaking, I'm not speaking as junior minister today, I'm speaking uh, as a, an MLA today. But you know that, that something could, could, can be done to ensure that those women um, who were over 18 are also included um, in some way um, uh, uh, to look at, at what happened to them. Also, I think. Yep. Can I just ask the, the member to further consider a, a north-south all-island character to it, in that the historical institutional abuse inquiry in the north and the proposed Commission of Investigation in the South, that they should cooperate specifically on the subject of cross-border movements over many decades of children, pregnant girls and women, and on the forced, illegal and international adoptions or boarding out arrangements of the majority of those children. It's just to ensure that any investigation, North or South or both, that it's as wide as possible. No, I mean, I totally agree with the member. I think that that has to happen. I think that, you know, even in some of the, the cases that have been discussing with, with some of the victims and survivors, the, the fact that we can't call it anything else. The children were trafficked north and south, and the children were trafficked south and north. So I think that, that really we need to have that all sort of island approach to this um, in order to, to get um, the, the detail of what actually happened. I have to say that um, I just... Can I just finish on that if I have time? Just, I just want to say that, that you know, one of the things for me that really, you know, when I was speaking to um, some, of, some of the people who, who had come up to, to see me in relation to the Michael and Laundries has always sort of way, was something that, 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 that stuck in my head as probably one of the most cruel um, uh, parts of it that I remember. Um, when they told me that there was a, an older lady um, who was working alongside a younger person in one of the Magdalen laundries. And, you know, they, they were working day by day together in, those laun in that laundry, and they, they built up a relationship, the younger person with the older woman, and, you know, um, through, through several years. And when the older woman died, one of the nuns actually called the young girl aside and said to the young girl, by the way, that was your mother. And, you know, for me, that just is the level of, you know, cruelty and the viciousness um, that, that, that people, you know, that those people, you know, were experienced and had to experience. And I think, you know, we all, we all have talked to survivors and victims of it. And I think, you know, we all probably have our own, uh, you, know, you know, sort of sense of it. I'm a mother myself, you know, and I just can't imagine what it would, would have been like for a mother to have to have given over their baby just after the baby was born, to be forced to do that, to be treated in such a way you know, I think that, that just all of us need, need to um, we need to help to, to uncover this this horror, this barbaric treatment, um, and we need to, to help the people to, to, to um, come to, to 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 get the information that they need. I just want to go through some of the, the main points that some of the in conclusion that some of the members have said here. Um, Barry McElduff, the proposer of the notion, outlined, as I said, the human cost to some of the harrowing stories, and he also gave a list of all the homes that, that we have now discovered that were in, in actual practice in the, in the north. But that's by no means uh, a, a list, you know, a definitive list. So we, we need to be investigating how many more were there. John Dallet uh, uh, also illustrated um, the, 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 this in terms of the treatment. Um, Mike Nesbitt read out a personal testimony, which I thought was, you know, um, you know, in terms of the records and how they, the people want it, they want the records to be made available. Trevor Lund pointed out that some of the, the homes didn't close until the 1980s. I think it's a very relevant point as well, because sometimes we think this happened, you know, uh, back then, but you know, it, it was happening right up until in, until the recent past. Danny Kennedy mentioned the church records from which all churches and denominations you know, should be um, given over to, to families and people who, who want those records made available. Brahma McGahan said again about the women being imprisoned and their human rights actually being discarded. 
and really that the children in those homes had no voices, and we really need to be their voices to speak for them if we can. Um, I'm sorry, uh, just to, to say that the column Eastwood finished very aptly, I think, in terms of he talked about the proclamation and the cherishing of all our children equally. I think, uh, Mr Speaker, this debate today is, is, is hopefully going to get cross-party support, and I would just say that, you know, that, that we need to ensure that those records are opened up, that the information is there for people, and we need to be helping the people in their campaign that haven't got the voice to do that. Order, members. The question is a motion standing and order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any knows, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next item of business in the order paper is question time. I therefore propose by leave of the Assembly to spend the sitting until 2 p.m.